Yeah, I've got Intel about lunchtime today. Boots, B-O-O-T-S. Probably. You're here in town. No, Tacoma. Here in town is uh, Rod Butters, Michael Bowman, and Toby Mathis. All right, great. Welcome everyone, I'm Greg Boots uh, with Anderson Law Group, Anderson Business Advisors. Welcome back to the second day. And before we get really into the, the nuts and bolts today, because I know we covered a lot of information yesterday, or, or Clint covered a lot of information yesterday, definitely want to uh, field a couple of questions from the audience here to see if anything is unclear. And what we're going to be doing today, as opposed to yesterday, is we're really going to get into the operation of the LLCs, when we use charitable remainder trusts, when we would potentially use foundations, living trusts, other types of irrevocable trusts, how they properly fit into your planning and, and, and when you shouldn't use them. Because with asset protection, it's not a, a one size fits all. Everybody has unique circumstances, unique plans that they wanna do post RV, and it, it is all about planning. And when it comes to planning, whether it's in regards to tax planning or asset protection, it all has to be done proactively. If you want to have that asset protection, you have to have that LLC in existence. If you're not in the LLC prior to any liability arising, if you want to have the tax planning opportunities, what we end up doing is post RV prior to casting out your dinar, then we look at setting up potentially charitable remainder trust, foundation, 501c3. So it all comes down to a, a matter of timing. And I appreciate everybody that that's here. It's my understanding today was the rapture. Everybody's still in Las Vegas, so I'm not sure if that actually occurred. I guess I'll find out when I get back to Seattle tonight. Uh, of course, all of the attorneys are still around. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 that, that's right. That's right. Today we're going to uh, unleash our rapture trust gov governed by attorneys. Um, Anybody here have any questions in regards to what Clint addressed yesterday that I could go over before we really get into the LLC? I don't have a question per se, okay. but it was a point that we discussed, I discussed with him afterwards. And I know uh, for the people who are part of the webinar, it yes. might be of value. Um, the, our attorney here, Rod, who handled mm -hmm. my LLC, made it very specific. He said, if you want to avoid any potential question mm -hmm. as to whether the LLC entity holds your dinar. He said, once you establish the LLC, open a safe deposit box and deposit the, uh, in the name of the LLC mm -hmm. and deposit your dinar in that safe deposit box, making, make the, making the appropriate notation in your LLC record. That right. way, now, no matter what happens, there's a clear record. You've made a deposit into the LLC of your dinar, mm -hmm. and they are in the safe deposit box, which is belongs to the LLC. And that, that's a great point. I'm a huge proponent of getting that safe deposit box open and, and putting the dinar in there in the name of the LLC. But there are instances where we don't have the opportunity, potentially, to go and get that safe deposit box open. And what asset protection is, it's strategic use of the law plus proper documentation. Everything that we talk about is always going to come down to the documentation. And so within my LLC, to be able to show that a transfer of ownership has actually occurred into the LLC, I need to make sure that I've properly filled out the member contribution and that's been ledgered within the LLC documents. And so if I don't have the opportunity to get that safe deposit box open or potentially even buy a safe in the name of the LLC, if a lawsuit develops, I have proof via the documentation that the transfer has occurred. And we'll get questions often, why would, as an individual, why would we want to go with your firm as opposed to somebody online? There is no magic in regards to hopping online and filing a business. Anybody can do that. The difference that separates us or a law firm from somebody that's just selling an online service is this comes down to the documents, making sure that you've crossed the I's and dotted the T's. 
Because unfortunately, when people go out and set up their own LLCs or corporations or living trusts, you don't know something's wrong until it's too late. A lawsuit's been filed. Once that lawsuit's filed, it's too late to, to fix the, the missing pieces within our plan. Or in the state planning, people will hop online and do their own will. Well, we won't know if anything's wrong with your will until somebody's passed away. Or, or if it's a living trust, you become incapacitated. And we can't change it at that point in time. And so it's a matter of having a, putting a good team in place to ensure that all of your documents are in compliance and are ultimately going to do what it is that they, you've been told that they're going to do. So that, that's a great point. Sir, did you have a question? Yeah, that was, um, that was part of my question. Well, I wanted to find out what physically happened to the Denard that you, for instance, uh, created a gift or you wanted to, if you, if you could say that you would put this, uh, you, your uh, lockbox or a uh, picture pocket box to me now. I want to know what physically happened to them. And also, I wanted to find out what, uh, when you looked up on yesterday, you said something about, uh, Okay, first part of the question in regards to what physically happens to the dinar. Not, none of the questions I can't hear. Okay. The que for those of you who didn't hear, um, the question was, when you create the LLC, or when a gift occurs, what physically happens to the dinar? Well, first part of the question was answered in that if you're going to be opening a safe deposit box, you would want to actually contribute the dinar to the safe deposit box. If you're not putting the dinar in a box, then it comes to a matter of you retaining possession, but having the proper documentation within the LLC to show that the transfer occurred. Now, in regards to the gift, in order for a true gift to occur, it's not just a matter of writing a statement saying that I'm giving you 10 million dinar. We have to have physical transfer of the asset to the person that you're gifting. They have to accept the receipt, and then they take the possession of the currency. That is a completed gift. But you lose all control, right? Absolutely. When you gift assets, the question was, do you lose control? Absolutely, you're going to lose control because that asset is no longer yours. And as we'll see as the day goes on today, that's when we start using LLC. Because we can gift out interest in our LLC that holds our currency, that holds our investments, and we gift out membership interest, but without relinquishing any type of control. Because you would still be the one that's in charge of distribution of the assets. And the person that you gifted the interest to can't pledge or transfer that asset to anybody else without your permission. So you keep control within the LLC? You keep control within the LLC. Okay, okay. It, without the LLC and you make a gift, they can do whatever they want with it. So in the LLC, you don't have to physically transfer it? Great question. Within the LLC, do you physically transfer? And the answer is no. I take my dinar and I place them. This is just an LLC. It's a bunch of documents. And I, and I take my dinar and I, I transfer them directly into this LLC. I put them in there. Now, in exchange for somebody to become a member, an owner in this LLC with me, and we'll talk about this more later, what I do as I have a piece of paper that's called a um, unit. It's a certificate showing ownership in that LLC. And I give this interest to my child or to my brother or to my cousin. That's step one. Step two, because what really shows ownership in a business entity isn't this little piece of paper. We have thousands of these back at my office and if I was going to go back tomorrow and, and print out millions of Microsoft shares or Google shares, does that really mean that I have ownership of Microsoft or Google? Absolutely not. What shows true ownership in any type of business, if it's a corporation, it's going to be the stock ledger. If it is an LLC, it's going to be the unit ledger. And I'll go over how we make these notations later. But if I'm gifting out my interest in this LLC to a child, I would indicate that the gift occurred or the transfer occurred within this ledger. 
And so out of all of my documents in terms of ownership, this is the one that I want to safeguard, this ledger that shows actual ownership. And the entire time, I remain in full control over the investments and the distribution of the assets, which is key. Because right now, if I gave my children $10,000, they would go to Best Buy and buy every single video game that they could. But I give them ownership of my LLC, and then I control when and if they receive any funds out of that LLC. Great question. We haven't actually talked about it yet, but it's been burning me for a couple of days here. What entity, if any, would be better to be a lender, if you're going to be a private lender, if you're going to be a hard money lender? Good question. What entity? If you're looking to do paper transactions lending through a business entity, the type of entity that I would use would be an LLC. And the reason why that's an inherently safe investment in that the, the note in and of itself isn't going to create any liability exposure for that company. Okay. Well, let's get at it then. What we're doing now is, is we're delving into the world of asset protection. Because different business entities provide different types of protection. And the reason why we want to use an LLC or even potentially a limited partnership for protection as a opposed to corporation comes down to the level of protection and what it is that they provide. Within LLCs, which stands for a limited liability company, there is no such thing as a limited liability corporation. LLCs are limited liability companies or potentially a limited partnership. Both of these entities provide asset protection. Corporations, they're not designed for asset protection. What a corporation is designed for is liability protection. And it's a major difference. So in regard to asset protection, with my currency, there's nothing involved in regards to investing in dinar that I'm concerned about creating any personal liability exposure to me. So I create a box. I create an LLC. I could potentially create a limited partnership. And we'll go over the differences why I would go over an LLC over a limited partnership. So I create this box and I take my investments, I take my dinar, and I contribute them directly to this LLC. I take my other inherently safe investments, whether it be silver or gold or, or anything else, because I'm not concerned about what goes on inside of this box that's going to create harm to me. Asset protection exists with LLCs and limited partnerships based upon what it is that I individually do as an owner within this company. The harm has nothing to do with the operation of this business. So if I have my investment sheltered away in a limited partnership or an LLC, and I, and I set this up in a proper state, and I go out and I hop on the interstate and I get in a car accident, did the car accident have anything to do with Greg owning this LLC? No. And so if I've set this up properly, I have the proper documentation and I set it up in a good state, no matter the harm that I personally incur, the courts will not allow the person that gets a judgment against me in a lawsuit to reach into this box. The assets are protected from the owners of the company. That is asset protection. Liability protection works differently. See, corporations are designed generally to run active businesses. And if a harm occurs inside of that corporation because I made a bad investment, I, I, I entered into a bad contract, it's the corporation that gets sued, not me personally. But if I took my corporation and I wanted to protect all of my investments, I have some inherent problems. Sir, what's your name? Pat. Pat, Pat has a brokerage account in his own name. He has 500,000 shares of Google stock doing very well. Now, at the break, I'm walking across the parking lot. Pat's going to go out, grab something to eat, and he notices there's, there's no one around. And I've got a couple strikes against me. First, I'm an attorney, and then secondly, Pat doesn't like being called on in class. 
So he checks, no one's paying attention, steps on the gas, and Pat runs me over. Now, Pat, I'm spry. You just winged me. So Monday, I go and file a lawsuit. Now, the fact that you ran me over have anything to do with you owning a personal brokerage account, having 500,000 shares of Google stock? No, it didn't. Now, if I sue you, because as an attorney, that's my nature, I will bring a lawsuit, and I'm successful in that lawsuit, can I potentially take that brokerage account away from you if I get a judgment in that lawsuit? That is correct, because that's an, when we have harm that occurs on an individual level, every asset that we own in our own name is potentially at risk. So what Pat does is Pat goes and he sets up a corporation. Now, Pat sets up Desert Inn Management, Inc. A Nevada corporation, but Pat's the only shareholder in that corporation. And what Pat does with his corporation is he takes his 500,000 shares of Google and he opens a brokerage account and puts that directly in the corporation. Now, in exchange for that contribution into that corporation, Pat gets stock in his own corporation because the stock is what shows ownership in a corporation. So Pat goes, rushes out, sets up that corporation, wants another shot at me, sees me again next time I down here, steps on the gas, hits me, but I live once again. I turn around and I sue Pat. Now the fact that Pat ran me over, did it have anything to do with this corporation? No, it's not the business purpose of the corporation to, to run over uh, attorneys. And so I bring a lawsuit against Pat. Now, we've already determined that it had nothing to do with the business activity. So I bring a suit against Pat. I'm successful in the judgment. All of his brokerage account is sheltered in his corporation. His dinars all sheltered in his corporation. And I get a judgment against Pat for $20 million. Will the courts potentially allow me to reach in that corporation? Yes. Yes, why, Pat? It's because you didn't follow proper procedure for, for the, the asset. Okay, I didn't follow proper procedure. And, and ultimately, the reason why I could potentially take ownership or take his interest in that corporation is because is there any difference in the eyes of the law between shares and Google and shares of Pat's Desert in or Desert Drive management. No, they're both stock certificates. And because of the nature of the asset remains the same, we don't want to use corporations generally to shelter out or to protect our assets because they're not designed for asset protection. The underlying interest is always potentially at risk. That's why we use LLCs or potentially limited partnerships because no matter what Pat does, if the harm doesn't have something to do with the activity in this LLC, you can't reach in there as a judgment creditor. The assets are always protected. And that's why we use LLCs and limited partnerships for protection purposes and not corporations because they provide different levels of protection. What all asset protection is all about is making ourselves appear as an unattractive target. Because as an attorney, what we do if somebody wants to bring a lawsuit, the very first thing that occurs before the case is taken, do an asset search on the person that the client wants to potentially sue. And if we see somebody that has a lot of wealth accumulated in their own name, they have a big old bullseye on them. They're a very attractive target. If you have assets, though, that are sheltered away and we can't see them, or even if we can see that you're involved in the business and the, court, the state only allows charging order protection, it's as if you don't own it to begin with. It's like Clint's attorney be gone that's sprayed over everything. It's not worth our time as an attorney to go and take that case. I'm training for an, an Ironman triathlon. It's going to be next month. And on Tuesday, I was out for a training run up in Issaquah, Washington, uh, where I live. 
and I was downtown off out for a run and there a car pulls up to a driveway and this woman looks left to make sure that no traffic's coming because she's turning right and she doesn't look right. Now, right when I get in front of her car, she steps on the gas. Thankfully, I was paying attention, so I just jumped up on the hood and went back down, wasn't hurt. Now, as an attorney, potentially wanting to bring a lawsuit, the car that she's driving could potentially say a lot about her net worth because I was hit by probably a 1982 Chrysler K car. It had a tan body, a black hood, and a blue door. Now, as far as a big old target, do you think that she had one on her? Absolutely not. And so if I was somebody that was just going out looking for a payday, I would be much rather happy to be hit by a Land Rover or a Lexus or a Porsche than this car. Now, I wasn't looking to get a payday and I wasn't hurt, and so no harm, no foul, but there are people out there that will intentionally put themselves in situations where they can create potential harm to them just so they can bring the lawsuit. So this woman in her Chrysler K car has a very small target, and as an attorney, it wouldn't be generally worth my time to take that case, but somebody that has the big old Mercedes is a different story, and so what we're doing with asset protection so we can still have all of those toys if we want to. But when push comes to shove, when that attorney is determining whether or not to take that case, if you don't have anything that we can see, or if it's all sheltered away, it's not worth our time to, to take the case. We're just reducing our overall risk exposure. But it all comes down to a matter of timing. You have to be proactive in regards to the planning. One of my all-time favorite calls that I ever received from a cl potential client, a gentleman who had gone to our class, this was about seven years ago, and six months after the class, he calls me up, and on the other line, he's whispering, and I, and I won't whisper just so everybody can hear me out, out on the internet. He said, Greg, this is Jeff. And I said, Jeff, why are you whispering? And he said, listen, in the background, I'm hearing, we know you're there, we followed you from your office, and I said, Jeff, what's going on? He said, at the process server. They tried to serve me at my office. Your business card was at my house. I need to get my LLC set up right now. And uh, I stifled a laugh and said, Jeff, buddy, you're going to have to ride this one out. Because if you know that you're going to be sued or if you're in the process of a lawsuit, yeah, you can set up LLCs or partnerships or other entities to dump your assets in. But what that will ultimately be classified as by the court is what is known as a fraudulent conveyance, an asset dump. And in those instances, when you know that you're involved in a lawsuit or you took that dinar that you held pre-RV and then all of a sudden it RVs and on the way there you get in that car accident or your child does something or your spouse does something and you rush out and set up that LLC and then dump it in post-RV because right now it's only valued at a million about roughly $1,200 and post-RV if it comes back at a dollar, it, it, it's valued at a million dollars. Well, to have proper protection, it's too late because the courts could potentially allow your judgment creditor to reach in there and pull those assets out. And so the questions that we're often confronted with is in regards to, well, why even set up an LLC pre-RV? Well, from a tax standpoint, it has no bearing whatsoever. But we never know when that liability exposure is going to potentially arise. That lady, little old lady that hit me, because she was probably in her 80s, had no idea that morning that she would hit an attorney at 6.30 at night. And thankfully, there was no injury. But you never know. And so by having the LLC set up pre-RV and taking that wealth and repositioning it out of your name, then no matter what happens, on a personal level with you or your spouse or your kids, those assets are going to be protected. And that's ultimately what we're doing with our LLCs and our limited partners, shielding ourselves away from liability exposure. This is a little different and unusual question. Um, I have 
two stepchildren mm -hmm. who live in Moscow. Okay. Now, I literally, uh, I did a, donate, a gift letter and I brought the dinar to Moscow, gave them the dinar, mm -hmm. and uh, they accepted it and signed the, the bottom mm -hmm. of the, the gift letter. And then subsequently, after setting up our LLC, I talked to Rod, that we can open up LLCs. You don't have to be an American citizen to have an LLC. You do not have to be an American citizen to have an LLC. However, when the LLC is created, we need to get a tax identification number for it. And when we get that tax identification number, we have to list who the, the manager or potentially the member of the LLC. And we have to have a tax identification number for that person. So if that person doesn't have a social security number, we need to get that person an individual tax ID number. Okay. Uh, my wife would be the managing partner in both cases. Okay. Um, and we thought we would set it up with a 1% uh, for my wife and a 99% for the, each child. Sure. Um, now, with that, we can actually enact business once the RV happens. We can cash it in. The tax liability would either be here or Russia, however they decide to, to handle that. Or Yes, because within an LLC, and we'll talk about the differences in regards to operations, that we have different people involved. We have the members who hold the ownership certificate, which is just a piece of paper, and then we have the manager that makes all investment decisions within the LLC. And as in regards to ownership versus control, I will always go with control as opposed to ownership. Because you want to be the one, especially if you're gifting out interest to your children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews, you never want to be able to put yourself in a situation where they can bind the company and they can enter into investments that you wouldn't want to enter into. You always want to be the one in control of the box. Absolutely. So just in this specific case, would it be best then um, let's, we gave each one a million dinar for my wife to put uh, 200,000 dinar so she has a specific percentage? Yes. If and I'll talk about this more later. If we have a manager, the person that's running the box, that also has ownership in here, in order to have ownership, she has to contribute something to the company. If we just gift out interest, we need to be make sure that we're doing so in a way that doesn't create a taxable gift. And in order to avoid the whole gift tax problem to begin with, we have people that are involved within the LLC make their actual contributions. That's not essential in every instance. We'll see ways around having to do that. Uh, but in regards to your wife, yes, absolutely have her contribute something so it reflects her 1% ownership in that company. Thank you. Talking about distributions out of an LLC, mm -hmm. if there's a just if there's somebody that's a 10% owner and there's somebody that's a 90% owner in, in an LLC and the manager, and the manager says, I'm going to pay myself. I'm sorry, I'm going to pay myself 50 grand. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he just takes a distribution. Then the owners have they 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 get nothing. Okay, so to, to recap your question. We have an LLC. Where we have a member, an owner, owns 10% and another one that owns 90%. And then we have a manager. Which is a 90%. Makes a distribution. Okay. Well, hold on. Okay, so the ma the manager takes money out, 50k. Yeah. Okay. Can that be done? 
I'm going to give you the classic weasel attorney answer. It depends. Um, it's going to do. It's going to depend, first of all, on how this LLC is structured. Is it a member-managed LLC or is it a manager-managed LLC? If it's a member-managed LLC where all of the owners at this level also control, yes, that could be done. If it's a manager-managed LLC, this money that's coming out to this member who's also a manager, this is not a distribution. This would either be salary or a guaranteed payment. And there's a distinction there. These types of funds are earned income. That means we're subject to employment taxes. Distributions. are passive income, not subject to employment taxes. So we can pay the manager a fee for running the company, regardless of his percentage of ownership, or the manager doesn't even have to have any ownership. But if we're going to have it be a distribution based upon profits, not based upon services rendered, Unless the LLC agreement states otherwise, we need to make a 10%, 90% distribution to everyone across the board. But you would never have to make a distribution. You do not have to make a distribution unless the operating agreement says otherwise. Because LLCs, more than any other business entity, LLCs are, are the, the entity du jour right now. Everybody's setting up LLCs because they're very easy to, to maintain. But almost every single LLC statute across the country will end in the exact same way. It'll say an LLC can do A, B, and C unless the operating agreement states otherwise. And so if the operating agreement doesn't specifically reference unequal distribution, or if the operating agreement requires mandatory distributions, then we have some inherent problems. And, and I'll talk about that when it comes to asset protection. Uh, when we're looking at the states, it, it comes down to what that operating agreement says. That is what's going to save you or hang you out the dry every single time, either in an audit or a lawsuit because it's that contract between the parties in that company that dictates how it's going to be run. And, and the reality with LLCs, even though they're so popular, they are the most complicated business structure there is in that we have single member, member managed, multi-member, member managed, single member, manager managed, multi-member, manager managed. LLCs can be disregarded for tax purposes, tax uh, partnerships, taxes as corporations, taxes C corporations. And whatever election, that you make when you file that LLC with the Secretary of State or when you get that tax identification number for that LLC, your operating agreement, the guts within this document, better correspond to the elections that you make. Otherwise, in a lawsuit or an audit, you have real problems. Thankfully, LLCs are very flexible. So if you've gone out and you've set up, let's say, for example, a member LLC and you realize that's not doing what you want, you can amend it. Or if you've chosen to have it be taxed as a partnership and you're the only one involved in that LLC, you can change it over to disregard it. Or if it's been an S corporation, we have flexibility to modify it. But again, it all has to be done proactively prior to the audit, prior to the lawsuit, prior to having somebody go out that's a member in that company and bind the LLC. And so LLCs are very, very document driven in regards to their operation and ultimately access to the funds. So sorry I gave you a bit of a weasel answer there, but it really depends upon how that LLC is structured. Do you guys practice in Oregon? Yes, I'm licensed in Oregon. And in regards to what it is that we do as far as interaction with our clients, our, our job, our role isn't to replace your local attorney. 
If I have a client that has a slip and fall on a rental property, I'm not the person that they call or Clint's not the person that they call to go and represent that LLC or that person in court because we're not litigating. But what we do and what our clients are paying us for when they have our platinum services at $35 a month isn't just to teach them how to use the business entity, but we're also on the phone with your local attorney if litigation arose. Or we're on the phone with your local CPA, making sure that all of the pieces are come together. Because as investors, regardless of what it is that we invest in, when it comes time to create and maintain a plan, you better have somebody that invests in a similar manner that you do. Because if you're using a professional that has no idea about currency investment or real estate or stocks, I guarantee you when it comes to planning and ultimately tax preparation that they're going to miss out on opportunities when it, when it comes to proper planning. Those of us out there, and we're not the only attorneys in the world that invest in dinar or invest in real estate or invest in the stock market, but what we've done and what CPAs that we work with have done, we've gone out there and learned the tricks of the trade for ourselves to minimize our tax liability, to give us exposure, and then we just are protection and, and we, we pass that on. Um, so we're an integral part of the overall process, but we're not there when certain issues do arise to, to step on anybody's toes. We work one-on-one -on -one with them. So for LLCs, in, in the asset protection component, it's like a limited partnership in that no matter what it is that we do on a passive level, on a, as a, outside of that company, our assets are protected from us. Now, why would I want to go with an LLC as opposed to a limited partnership if they both provide the same protection? Well, that answer depends upon the overall structure of the company and, and what it is that we're looking to achieve. Because within a limited partnership, we have two types of partners. We have general partners, and we have limited partners. Limited partners are completely passive in the business. No decision-making authority. All control is done by the general partner. Now, in regards to liability exposure, if I had a limited partnership and I was doing something other than investing in dinar, let's say, for example, I had a limited partnership that had a rental property in there. Why? Because if there's injury on that rental property, I want to make sure that Greg doesn't individually get sued. So my role in this limited partnership is as a limited partner. I'm completely passive in nature. But somebody has to run this company. And let's say that the general partner is Clint. Now, I and Clint both contributed this property to this limited partnership. It's valued at $100,000. I'm 90% and Clint is 10%. And then we have a tenant. I've been drawing this for 13 years. It's as good as it gets. This is a tenant falling down the stairs. Harm occurred inside of the company. Now, my contribution was 90%. $90,000 is what Greg contributed to this partnership. I had no control over the partnership. If a lawsuit develops and this person gets a judgment, let's say, of a million dollars, and there's only $100,000 of assets or worth of assets in that limited partnership, can Clint and I both lose this property in a lawsuit? Absolutely. No matter what entity we use, whether it's a corp, LLC, limited partnership, irrevocable trust, 
If the harm arises on the asset itself, the asset is always at risk. We can never protect the asset. What we're doing in regard to planning in this instance is we're looking to protect ourselves individually from harm that can arise from our investment. So we have a million dollar judgment against this limited partnership with only $100,000 of assets in there. Now I made no business decisions whatsoever. Can the person that brought this lawsuit come after me personally for the remaining 90% of that debt? No. And the reason why is that I was completely a passive investor. It's very similar to investing in publicly traded companies. When the Exxon Valdez back in 1989 smashed into Bly Reef up in Alaska and they get a $3 million judgment against Alaska, uh, pardon me, against Exxon, did the state of Alaska go knocking on every single shareholder's door asking them to kick in to the judgment? Or if you invested $10,000 in the Exxon stock, could you lose more than that $10,000 investment? What do you guys think? Would you invest in a company that if that company got sued, you could personally lose your home and all of your other assets? No. So when you're a shareholder, when you're a limited partner, if anything goes wrong inside of that company, whatever your investment contribution was, whether it's cash, whether it's property, anything, the maximum amount that you can lose in a lawsuit, if everything's set up right, is whatever you contributed. So I'm out 90000 bucks, but we still have $900,000 left out there in, in regards to deficiency judgment. Now, Clint contributed 10%. Can he lose his 10% that he contributed to that company? Does Clint, as the general partner, have any other risk? Yes, what would that be? Okay. What it is, is that when you're a general partner, since you have unlimited control, you also have unlimited liability. So just like a sole proprietorship, if I own that rental property in my own name and there was a slip and fall, yes, I can lose the property and then they're going to come after all of my other personal assets as well. Clint, as the general partner, cannot separate out his personal assets from his investment assets. So if there is a harm, not only does Clint lose his initial 10% contribution, they're going to go after the general partner for the remaining $900,000 in liability exposure. Who wants to be a general partner? And see, that's where Clint, no, Clint won't. Um, so that's an inherent downside in regards to limited partnership. In order to cap out that liability exposure on these types of investments, Clint and nobody in their right mind is going to be a general partner. What we need to do is we need to set up a corporation to be the general partner. So from an asset protection standpoint, if harm occurs inside of the company, a limited partnership requires us to create two businesses. One, to hold the asset, and another, to manage the asset. We don't have that requirement in LLCs. Now, in regard to our dinar, is there anything that's going to go on inside of this limited partnership with our dinar investment that is going to create risk for Greg, the limited partner, or in regards to harming my investment. No, it's a safe asset. The only thing I've been able to think of in regards to liability exposure for my dinar is that if I have so much of it, I just leave it all over the ground, somebody comes over to my house, slips and falls on it, then the asset created the harm. But other than that, in regard to this currency, there's nothing in and of itself that's going to create any liability exposure for me. So in this instance, being a general partner, 
is okay because there's nothing going on in here because it's safe that's going to create risk to the general partner. Now, what if I'm single, I'm not married? A limited partnership requires two partners. Greg personally cannot be the general partner and the limited partner. So if I'm a single individual and I have no intent to gift out interest to anybody, I would still be required to create a corporation to be the general partner. Now it's my corporation and me personally that own the limited partnership. I've met the requirement of two or more. Now I'm not single, I'm married, and so the general partner in my family isn't Greg, it's Lori, my wife. She wants to oversee the investment. So I, Lori and I can create a limited partnership, put all of our dinar in there. We've got great asset protection. There's nothing that's going to go on in here that's going to cause Lori any risk exposure. But if my only goal was asset protection, I could set up an LLC. Why would I want to set up a limited partnership? What's the difference at this point between an LLC and a limited partnership? Well, with an, a limited partnership, since we have to have two, two or more owners, you are automatically required, you have to file a 1065 partnership return. It doesn't matter since Lori and I live in a community property state, husband and wife are normally treated as one person, not in regard to a limited partnership. So if all I want to do is have asset protection, yes, I've created great asset protection, but I've also just given a nice income stream to my CPA because no matter what now, I always have to file a partnership tax return. So I've increased my cost of doing business for the asset protection. Within an LLC, I can have the same asset protection, and if I set it up properly, we file zero tax return. So from an overall planning standpoint, to protect our currency, where all we're looking to do initially is to protect, not tax planning uh, um, option, I'll almost always go with an LLC as opposed to a limited partnership because a limited partnership ties our hands. We don't have the flexibility. It has to file that annual return both at the federal level and if your state has income taxation as well, at, at the state level, which increases my cost of business and hasn't provided me any asset protection. And so that's why we're advocating using LLCs as opposed to limited partnerships. Because within an LLC, I can have it not only where I don't have to file any additional tax returns, if I want, I can have all of the members actively participate in the management of the company and not have that risk that Clint had as the general partner. Going back to that, that same situation where if I created an LLC and we put that rental property in there, and we have Greg and Clint that are both members and managers, and the value of that property is $100,000, again, we have our slip and fall, and we get a million dollar judgment, Can Clint and I, that LLC, lose that rental property? Yes. yes. So we lose the hundred. That leaves nine hundred thousand dollar judgment left over. Who owned the property? Greg and Clint or the LLC? LLC. LLC. So now with this LLC structure, can the court or the person that has the judgment credit against us, the judgment against and says, come after Greg and Clint for the deficiency $900,000. No. What do we do? 
will dissolve the LLC. And so now, in this scenario, unlike the limited partnership where I had to have a corporate general partner to cap that liability exposure, I can create one business and protect everyone. It's much more efficient. Yes, let me get you the mic. If you dissolve um, the LLC, mm -hmm. then what happens to the property? What happens, if I dissolve the LLC, what happens to the property? What ended up happening in that situation is the property had to get sold because ultimately the person that's suing, they don't want the property. They want the cash value of the property. Property gets sold, there's no other assets in the LLC, LLC dissolves, and that outstanding judgment goes away with it. So remember, no matter what I put that property in, if the harm arises from that asset, I can never protect the asset from itself. And a lot of times what people will do is they'll go and in this scenario and they'll set up an LLC and they'll put their home in the LLC. Now this is good potentially in regards that if, if this is my wife and I, if either one of us get involved in a car accident, I have potential asset protection from my home or because it's within this LLC. It creates an additional hoop that somebody has to jump through. But my kids, they invite their friends over and they're out in their little tree fort. Yeah, you can tell this is the first time I've ever drawn a tree. Um, and a, a kid falls out of the tree. Where did the harm occur? On an individual level or inside the LLC? Is the house at risk? Yes. So if you put your LLC or your home in an LLC and somebody comes and slips down the stairs or drowns in your pool or, or falls out of a tree, the home is always at risk. It can never protect the asset from itself, regardless of the type of entity that we use. Now, there are other things that we can do that we'll talk about, but if the harm occurs in here, everything in this company is at risk. Okay, here's my question. You have an LLC mm -hmm. that has this house, okay? Yes. You have another LLC over here that subleases, mm -hmm. and then you have a renter over here. So this LLC. Let me draw it out. Did the first LLC just have a rental or your home? First LLC holds an asset, a house. Rental? House. Home? It makes a difference. Is it an investment property or your home? It's, it's the LLC owns a property. Okay. Okay. Now you have another LLC. Okay. And Can you it, hold the mic up? And what it does is it rents properties from that LLC. That LLC rents properties from that LLC. Okay. For $500 a month. And it subleases sub that property to a landlord, or to, uh, excuse me, to a tenant uh -huh. for $750 a month. That's what that LLC does. It rents properties and then re-rents them. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, what's the question? Is that asset protected now? Okay, so I have a tenant. Where does the tenant live? Right? Tenant has slip and fall. Is the asset at risk? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because the harm arose here. Is this LLC protected that has gone and entered into the transaction to rent? Sure. But are there any assets? No. So all you've done is created an additional entity with no additional protection. Well, the, the reason that I asked that question is because I used to sublease from another renter. Mm -hmm. So he had a big commercial building and I re leased space from him. Mm -hmm. So he didn't own that building. Right. So whoever did own that building was at risk. Correct. Whoever owns the asset 
and the harm arises. Is that mic not working? It's working, but okay. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, question was is that if the harm occurs here and we're leasing it to this other LLC, does it protect that asset? No. That's not what it's designed to do. Why? Because the harm occurs here. But let's take that one step further. Let's forget about this leasing company. And I have an LLC that owns another property and I have an LLC that holds my currency, safe assets. Pat, correct? Pat owns all of these LLCs. He has a slip and fall on this one property. Is this property at risk? Yes. Can then, let's say that this person gets a million dollar judgment, but there's only 30K in equity on that property. Woefully deficient. Can they come after Pat? No, because Pat didn't own the asset. Pat, though, owns a lot of other LLCs that holds all of his work. His, his, his investment capital. Just for the fact that Pat owned that, these LLCs can now they come after this company and this company. Only if you're in California. Well, California. You know what? <laughs> Even in California, because we'll see there's different levels of protection. Even in the worst state in the country to do business, all states that the harm occurs in here, inside, the harm stays inside. The difference in states like California is that if Pat creates the harm, then we can reach in and pull assets out. So what we want to do is segregate our assets. The fact that we have a manager or a leasing company leasing out this property doesn't matter. If the harm occurs on that property, that property is always at risk. So what it's a matter of doing with any type of planning is risk minimization. If Pat, instead of having these other two LLCs, put the other property in here and all of his, his dinar, his gold, his stocks, and we had a, a slip and fall, what does Pat have at risk? Everything. Everything. And so we always need to be mindful we're in an asset can create potential harm in and of itself never to commingle safe assets in there. Does that answer your question? Kind of uh, answered my question in, in this too. You mentioned 30K of equity. Mm -hmm. My thing is to you know, leverage stuff up so it's still not going to be a benefit to someone to come and get it. Right. So now you've got a $100,000 property in your LLC. You have the slip and fall. It's leveraged at $110,000. What would generally happen? They're only going to be able to go if there's liability. They're going to basically force a sale of the asset to cover the, the judgment. And whatever equity is in there is potentially at risk. If there's no equity, it's not worth their time unless they actually want to take ownership of the property. But then we have this debt out there that needs to get satisfied. And so if it's in a negative position, nobody's going to want the property either. Absolutely. It's all about just segregating out, creating all of these little boxes to minimize our exposure. Now, we have two different types of LLCs, two main types. We have member managed and manager managed. Now, with a manager managed, this is like similar to a limited partnership. In which it's the manager that controls. The manager makes all investment decisions and the members are passive. Sir, what's your name? Lewis, so at the beginning of this morning, Lewis asked a question in regards to maintaining control over the investments that he wants to gift out. For Lewis, he wants to have a manager-managed LLC in which Lewis is the manager. 
So when he has his family members and he gifts them ownership in this company, Lewis remains in control of the investments. The fact that Lewis's son holds ownership in this company is irrelevant in regards to control of the company. Because in a manager-managed LLC, the members are passive. They are not involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the investments or, or the business. What Lewis would not want to do is to create a member-managed LLC. Because the members own and control the LLC. Once. So if Lewis went out and set up a member-managed LLC and gave his son and anybody else ownership within this LLC, they can make the investment decisions in this company with Lewis something that he doesn't want because they could potentially elect, depending upon the operating agreement, to make distributions. And another problem with a member-managed LLC is that all members bind the company. See, our law firm, Anderson Law Group, it's a professional limited liability company. And because it's a member-managed LLC, it has to be a member-managed LLC owned and run by attorneys, Anybody that has ownership in that company can go out and bind Anderson. So we used to have a partner that decided he wanted to practice maritime law. And we came back from an, a teaching in an event, and he had purchased over $30,000 of maritime law case, case books. So we said, why didn't you just get the DVD for $2,000? He said, well, I did buy the DVD, but I don't really like reading on my computer. And, and doesn't this, all these books make my office look nice? Now, he went out there and incurred this $30,000 debt on behalf of the company, unbeknownst to myself and Clint and Toby. Were all of us liable on that $30,000 debt? Yes, because anybody that has ownership can bind the company. And so when we're bringing our family members into the fold to, to be able to participate and, and, and reap the benefits of this investment, you don't necessarily want them to have the same control that you do in regards to investment. You want to share the wealth, but, but not give anybody else potential ability to bind and make investment decisions that are counter to what you want to do in regard to the business. Actually, you brought up the very point I was going to ask. So you can have one of the members be the managing member, period. Great question. Managing member or manager? Uh, well, when we set up the LLC, um, Toby mm -hmm. resigned, well, okay. and they and nominated me as the managing member, and of course now I am the managing member of the LLC. Not quite. I'm sorry, sir, what's your name? Ron. Ron. Ron has what is known as a manager-managed LLC. Ron fills two roles here. One as the member the owner. Ron is also the manager. The fact that Ron ha is in that management position, the manager doesn't have to have ownership. You do, but you don't have to. See, when that LLC is originally created, Toby is the manager. He's what is known as the nominee. Toby has no ownership in your company. So once this business files, Toby resigns. And then Ron is appointed as the manager. 
So Ron calls all of the shots without ever relinquishing any ownership in the company. You can have anybody that you want be the manager of your LLC, but if they don't resign, they can potentially bind the company. That's why it is absolutely essential that when you use a nominee, they immediately resign. Now, what Ron does is Ron goes out and he opens up a bank account. And he has his assets in this LLC. Now, with the Secretary of State on this LLC, it shows Toby Mathis, or A.T. Mathis, down as the manager. But when the account was open, was it Toby or Ron that interacted with the bank? <coughs> it's Ron. Ron is the manager. So the fact that we have a nominee, and this is a concern, and I believe it's a legitimate concern, is that when you use a nominee, do they get to run the business? No, because that nominee immediately resigns. Ron and who are all of our other clients get appointed in that manager position, and Ron makes every single business decision that there is in regards to that company. Okay, then at renewal. Toby is appointed again as a temporary manager for filing, that's right, for filing only. Ron still has full control over his bank accounts. Toby could not flip out and go down the Bank of America and get control of those accounts. First, Toby doesn't know where they're at. He doesn't have any information in regards to the accounts. He doesn't want to have any of that information. Toby files and then immediately resigns. So during this entire process, because the Secretary of State in Nevada, just like almost every other state, requires that you annually file for the privilege of doing business in the state. Toby is up for one second as the manager for filing purposes only. It goes into the Secretary of State, immediately resigns. Ron has been conducting business this entire time without any involvement from Toby. Uh, Pat just asked, can it be anyone for filing purposes? Absolutely, but I would use someone, first of all, that is located in the state um, and, and also that you have a, a fiduciary relationship with. Because as an attorney, Toby can't go out there um, without major penalties and do anything counter to the, the entity that he is representing. So in order for Toby to do this on a recurring basis, yes. we need to maintain the 695 boss services or would the platinum service be acceptable? Which is the option? Good, good question in regards to what it is that you're paying for when you're dealing with Anderson and you're dealing with Boss. Anderson and Boss provide two different services. Anderson is the, the law firm component, and so the platinum membership is be talking with myself or Clint or Mike or Rod or any of the attorneys that work for Anderson on the day-to-day -day operation of the business. What Boss does is it maintains your compliance with the Secretary of State. So com there's the resident agent component that's provided by a, a business out of the boss office called Acorn Corporate Services. They're the resident agent. It deals with the nominee. Uh, if we're having to do any type of minutes or resolutions, Bob, Han or not Bob, Boss handles all of the, the minutia in regards to business activity. In essence, then, um, if like we bought the uh, the big package, and mm -hmm. I also paid for the expedited, so we paid the twenty three ninety five plus the expedited fee for the Correct. quick turnaround. Uh -huh. um, come the end of the year, when I need to refile, yes, do so I? If you set it up, with, say in April, you would refile again in April. Okay. So that being the case. Um, do I then revert to platinum status or how? When it comes to the end of the year and you're going to refile, 
you can continue, and most of our clients do, the platinum service with Anderson because we're teaching you how to continue to use the business. Mm -hmm. And then the boss is, is the Nevada Nexus component in, in regards to business office, resident agent, et cetera. How much is it cost? $6.95. A year. Yes. Uh, Anderson, there's no back end. You can have support consultation. For life, it's just $35 a month. That's what our clients are really paying us for, isn't to file the business and, and, and draft the documents. And I, and I don't want to take away from the, the importance of the documents because we'll be talking more and more about that. But what, what we get paid for on a daily basis is to teach our clients how to use what it is that you have right now. And most importantly, as your investments start to diversify, when do you need a corp or when do you need a crut or, 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 or you're looking to do this type of investment? Do you want to put that rental property in that LLC? You bounce those questions off of us because it's so much easier to do it right up front than it is to try to undo a transaction. And so we keep that open line of communication. And, and this is what we've done from the inception. We're, we're, we're building clients for life. And, and when it comes right down to it, I'm not going to lose all my law license, and I know Clint and Toby and Mike and Rod, we're not going to put our licenses at risk for $1,500. Um, you know, we only make recommendations based upon sound principles. Um, if you want to go over to another area, um, we'll give you our opinion on it, and, and then you make that decision on your own. Can, Ron, can you pass that mic back to you? One last question. If if I had a trust prepared by someone else, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to say, okay, uh, to continue, we're going to, the, the RV occurs, and I say, Rod, I want to set up three more LLCs immediately, da 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 I have this trust. We want to put the LLCs in the trust. What would normally be the process there? If you have existing entities, whether it be a trust or a corp or an LLC, more than happy to review what it is that you have, and then we can make recommendations. Generally, when we're dealing with a trust, for most of the time, trusts don't need to be restated unless there's something glaringly wrong. But when we set up an LLC for somebody that has a trust, we'll make sure that that ownership in that LLC gets transferred into that trust. Because we want to keep your overall plan viable uh, and ultimately do what it's designed to do. Yes, sir. In your example there where Ron is the manager and he has a member, which is his wife, does uh, she make decisions like if they're both on the bank account? If Ron has this LLC and Ron's wife is also a member, does she make decisions in regard to the bank account? Um, no, unless she is also a manager. Just because she's a member doesn't mean that she has any type of control on the investments when it's a manager managed LLC. So then should they be switched to member managed if both want to have uh, participation on the bank account? Good question. So let me draw this out. We have an LLC. It's member managed. We have Ron and wife. Since it's member managed, everyone has full control. So Ron initially set up this member managed LLC because he wanted his wife involved and she wanted to be able to write checks and, and, and control the investments. Makes sense. But what people typically will do over time is wealth accumulates. Is Ron will probably start to gift out interest to his kids or to his grandkids. And so once Ron and his wife start gifting out interest to their children, can the children and the grandchildren go and start interacting in the transactions on behalf of that company? Yes, because it's member managed. So in order for Ron and his wife to maintain control over that company, what they would do is instead of setting up a manager or a member managed LLC, they would have a manager 
manage the LLC. Ron is a member. His wife is a member. Ron is a manager. And his wife is a manager. Now they have full control. Then they gift out interest to kids, grandkids. Have Ron and his wife relinquish any type of control over the company? No. And that's why from a long-term planning perspective, manager managed is better because you can gift out those interests and never relinquish any type of control. If they started with a member managed LLC and they knew enough that, well, maybe we don't want these kids to be able to bind the company, then what would have to happen is we would need to amend the LLC and go from a member managed to a manager managed, which is a bit of a hassle. So from long-term planning, just start out with manager managed, and, and then you have that type of control. And if Ron wants a child involved in the management at some point in time, they can add their child as a manager as well. So then we would have to take these, that we, um, the LLCs that have been created, and we'd have to tweak them to change the status of the wife to manager versus member. If you have a manager, or yes, if you have a manager managed LLC right now, and you're the only manager, you can nominate your spouse or get your spouse appointed as a manager as well. That's a sw simple tweak that you can do in the office? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and the second question was um, the other example with the annual filing, uh, minutes, whatever. Uh, do we have to trigger you or do you trigger us? Boss will trigger you when it comes time to do your annual filing. And what about the minutes? And well, with an LLC, and this is re one of the reasons why an LLC is popular over a corporation, a corporation has to have annual shareholders meetings and annual directors meetings. An LLC does not have to have annual meetings. You can have them, but you're not required. The catch is, though, and this is why you want to know your operating agreement, because I have reviewed countless operating agreements for clients across the country where within the documents, it'll say that you have to have an annual meeting and it'll be buried on page seven. If you have this LLC and you're not having that annual meeting, even though the state doesn't require it, because remember, the statutes are an LLC can do X, Y, and Z, unless the operating agreement says otherwise, You've just given me an excellent opportunity as an attorney when I sue you to potentially pierce into that LLC. Or if the harm occurs inside of here, to come after you individually if you're not following what your operating agreement says. And a good operating agreement is worth its weight in gold. Excellent. Thank you. You bet. In my specific case, I'm the managing partner. Um, we have the dinar in the LLC. Mm -hmm. We did open a business account where we both can sign on the uh, business right. checking account. Sure. That that does not. She does not need to be a managing partner. No. In that you, case, you can designate within your business who uh, whomever you want that has signing authority on that. Account. Excellent. Thank you. So from a long-term planning perspective, we prefer manager managed over member managed. If you've already created a member managed LLC, it's not the end of the world. It, it can be uh, amended. If you don't amend it, just remember that anybody that you bring into the fold has full authority then to bind that company and make you then liable for the debt. Now, we have the LLC structured then as either member managed or manager managed. Whether there's one person involved in the LLC or a thousand, it doesn't matter. Unlike a limited partnership where we have to have two or more, an LLC can have one person and still have all of the protection. The other nuance when it comes to an LLC in regards to its flexibility is how it's taxed. See, when we were in law school in the 90s, LLCs weren't very popular because none of the professionals knew how the LLCs were going to be taxed. And in 97, after we, we got out of law school, what ended up happening is the IRS passed check-the-box regulations. 
And so when you create an LLC and you get a tax identification number for it, an E, known as an EIN, an employee identifi employer identification number, you fill out an SS4 form. And on that SS4 form, there's going to be a box to be checked as a partnership, a C Corp, an S Corp, or disregarded for tax purposes. And whatever little box you check, you need to make sure that within that operating agreement, it allows the entity, the LLC, to be taxed that way. Uh, two years ago now, uh, the IRS set, started heavy audits on LLCs that have elected to be taxed as S corps. And having an LLC taxed as an S corporation is fine when it's an active business. Our firm is taxed as an S corporation. But you have to have the provisions that allow it to be taxed as an S corporation. Otherwise, that tax status will get disallowed and you're going to be subject to penalty within that business. And so an LLC is a, is a hybrid entity. You can choose however you want to have it taxed. And so when Lori and I created that limited partnership where she was the general partner and I was the limited partner or vice versa, it didn't matter, we had to file a 1065 partnership return. What we can do with the LLC, we have Greg and Lori as members and also managers. If you live in a community property state, Washington, California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Louisiana, uh, Wisconsin, Alaska, I think that's all of them. A husband and wife are treated as one person in a community property state. So since we live in Washington, Lori and I are treated as one person. This LLC is what is known as disregarded for tax, which means we file zero tax return. The gains on the transactions within that LLC will report on our 1040 tax returns as if the LLC does not exist. Now, we have a lot of different investment activities that we are involved in. So we'll have an LLC for our dinar, We'll have an LLC for our rental properties. We have four LLCs. If these were taxed as partnerships, how many tax returns would we file? Four. Since they're all disregarded for tax purposes, how many tax returns do we file? Zero. Zero, except for our personal return. So I still have the same level of asset protection where if I have this tenant do the slip and fall, I lose that property, but everything else is protected, and I don't have to file any additional tax returns. Now, if I don't live in a community property state, what will happen is that when this LLC is created, Lori will own it. This LLC, Greg will own. This LLC, Lori will own. This LLC, Greg will own. Now, on paper, that looks good. But what about the reality of the world and that, that what if she divorces me or we get a divorce or what, well, potentially I can lose my assets? I know that without a doubt, she's not going to let me go on an LLC in which she doesn't have some type of ownership in there. How do we then overcome this problem if I live in Oregon or if I live in New York? Lori and I have a living trust, the Boots Living Trust. And so when this LLC is, these LLCs are created, I transfer my units, my ownership, Lori transfers her units,
into the cell, into the living trust. So now, in effect, all of these LLCs are owned by the living trust. Who owns the living trust? My wife and I. So now we both have joint ownership again on the assets and we're not having to file separate tax returns. And that alleviates concerns in regards to marital assets and keeps our life simple in regards to tax returns. Now, you will oftentimes though invest with people that aren't your spouse. And when we do that, I'm not willing to have an LLC where Greg owns one, Clint owns one, Toby owns one, if these are all our joint investments. So by default, what most people end up doing is an LLC will be set up with Greg, Clint, and Toby. Greg, Clint, Toby, Greg, Clint, Toby. Can these LLCs where the three of us are married, or not, are not married, have, uh, be disregarded for tax purposes? No. no, so that means we file one, two, three partnership returns. Gets expensive. So what we do, just in regards to minimizing our tax liability, or our tax reporting, is that we have these LLCs. So we have one with rental property, an inherently dangerous asset. Clinton, Toby, and I create a big LLC. And we'll put the other ones in there. So this LLC then wraps around, we'll call it a holding LLC that Greg, Clint, and Toby will own. And so we put our two real estate LLCs in there, we put our Dinar LLC in there. How many LLCs do Greg, Clint, and Toby own now? One. How many partnership tax returns do we file now? Just one 1065. And it doesn't matter how many different LLCs we have created inside of this holding company, we still just file one tax return. Now, as we'll see, there's another benefit in regards to holding LLC because not all states have the same level of asset protection that Nevada has. And I wanna make sure that my name's not associated with these companies in these other states and I maintain my good asset protection. So let's say for example, this is a California LLC and somebody does an asset search on this California LLC, it'll show up as being owned by a Nevada LLC does our name appear in regards to ownership of this company? No. So we've reduced our tax reporting down to one tax return, and it doesn't matter how many LLCs we set up across the country, we're, we're ma maintaining our privacy. And this works great when you start investing with people that are other than your spouse to minimize the tax reporting that you have to do. All of these LLCs inside of here are single member. Who's the single member? It's the holding company. Greg, Clinton, Toby, we are the members and ultimately the managers of this company. So we make all investment decisions. So then we have a slip and fall on this LLC, does it risk anything else inside of this holding company? No, not at all. What we end up doing ultimately is that that LLC that created the harm gets dissolved. And then we just continue business forward. And it gives us great protection and great flexibility without making our life overly complicated. As attorneys, attorneys are, are, are notorious for making structures overly complicated. 
so much so that you don't understand what it is that you have. We can have great asset protection, great tax planning opportunities with a very simple structure that can build off of itself over time. Because the worst thing that a professional can do is set you up into all of these multi different layers of trust and all of these different tax returns when you could have achieved all of your protection with just one box that you can build off over time. So on that note, yes, I'm sorry, let me get you the mic. Do you have still have to open up an individual uh, checking account for each one of those, or can you just do one yeah. checking account for the holding company? Can, do you still have to open an account for each LLC, or is it just one for the holding? You still need to have an account for each company. Why? Because we need the ability, and, and we'll talk about this right after the break, to flow profits out of that company. If there's no, no account in here, there's no way to get profits from that asset in that LLC down to the holding company. So yes, each business is separate and distinct. Doesn't file a tax return, but it's a separate formal business entity. Each one has its own tax identification number, and each one will ultimately have their own account. So let's go ahead and take a 10-minute uh, break. Sure.
now, what we were talking about before is in regard to how many members do we have in an LLC, how is an LLC to be run, and again, it is very flexible in terms of how it's created, and any, I don't want to say mistake, but if you file an entity or an LLC and you realize that you might want to tweak the structure, it's very simple process to amend and, and, and get a proper operating agreement as well. We work with clients all the time that have already gone and set up their LLC and then they find that they're missing an operating agreement and that's ultimately the most important component within the filing. So now we're going to talk a little bit about more about asset protection and, and the different types uh, of asset protection that we're dealing with with LLCs and other entities and, and a little bit of this is just going to be a refresher. First and foremost, what we're looking at is inside liability exposure, where the harm occurs inside of the box. And remember, in, in, in any state, California, Louisiana, Washington, Nevada, Wyoming, New York, Florida, any state, if you set up the business properly and the harm occurs inside of the box, you as the owner of the box don't assume personal liability. Even with a corporation, you could put the asset in there and you followed all of the corporate formalities and the harm occurs in here, you as the shareholder don't assume personal liability, regardless of where you set this up. Where the states, though, differ vastly is when it comes to outside liability protection. When it's us individually that create the harm that has nothing to do with our investments or our active businesses. And so this is now where we need to start looking at where is the best state to create our business. And there are many factors that we look at. What is the judicial rate or the judicial remedy in the state? Does this state allow charging order protection? Does it allow judicial foreclosure? What type of business activity that I'm doing? These are all factors when we're looking to set up businesses. And ultimately, or ideally, we want to be in a state that has charging order protection. Because basically when we're dealing with charging orders, what's happening is that when us as the owners of the company get sued, the courts will not allow the person or the party that sues us to get this the judgment against us the ability to reach in and pull out the asset. So no matter what we do as, as owners in that company, our investments are protected. And you'll see here that states are not necessarily the same where we have charging order protection in regards to limited partnerships. Does it necessarily mean that the same state will have charging order protection in regards to LLC. We, no matter what type of business entity that we set up for our dinar or our other liquid and safe assets, we want to have it in a state where the charging order is the sole and exclusive remedy. Because that currency, the gold, the brokerage account is never going to do anything to potentially harm us. We're only concerned about what it is that we do personally or if we gift ownership out to our kids, what they do personally. So the investment is always protected inside of the box. And these are the states that judicial or charging order is the sole and exclusive remedy. Now, I want you to notice on these states down here with Alabama, Alaska, Nevada, Wyoming, Washington, Oklahoma, it doesn't matter from a protection standpoint whether I am the sole owner of this LLC or I have a hundred different members of this LLC or it's myself and my spouse and my kids or it's Clinton, Toby and I. It doesn't matter if I'm single or multiple people, the charging order is the sole and exclusive remedy. So you'll hear people out there say, oh, you don't want a single member LLC because they're going to get pierced. No, 
not the case. If you set up the single member LLC in a state where the charging order is the sole and exclusive remedy. So how does a charging order work then? What is it exactly? Well, when I have a charging order, what it is, and I have an LLC where it's Greg, Lori, and my wife, what they do is that that judgment, they put a lien on her interest. When somebody has a charging order against the owner in the company, they have no control. They cannot force distributions. No forced distributions or liquidations. Basically, all they have is a lien against my wife's interest. And if this is our LLC, where both Greg and Lori are also the managers, and if we elect to distribute out the funds, because this is when the lien kicks in, when we do a distribution, the lien attaches at that point in time. So I reach into the LLC for my wife and I, and we distribute out some cash. As soon as that distribution goes out to Lori, the person with the charging order sweeps in and grabs her distribution. If it's your LLC with you, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, and somebody has a charging order against their interest, are you going to make a distribution? No. And attorneys know that. So when I'm doing an asset search on somebody and they have this LLC set up in a state that doesn't have anonymity, so I can see that they're involved in this LLC, but the charging order is the sole and exclusive remedy, it's not worth my time going after. Because I know that no matter what, these people aren't going to distribute out funds and the courts aren't going to allow me to reach in and pull the assets out. Now, let's say that my wife and I need funds. Well, what we could potentially do is take out a loan. Or what we could do is potentially pay ourselves a salary. So we can still have money available to us. The charging order only applies to the distribution. So we're not relinquishing control from ourselves. And so the reality is, it's when it's a closely held partnership, a closely held LLC, and the charging order is the only remedy, we're not going to go after it. Because we know that you guys aren't going to make distributions out of it. And if you need money, you'll structure it as a loan or other potential uh, earned income source that we can't attach. Well, why even have a charging order then? Well, charging orders do work when we have Greg, Lori, Ron, Pat, um, New York guy, New Jersey guy, Florida lady, people, LLCs and limited partnerships exist where the members don't even know each other. It's in large investment company. And I go out and I get in a car accident and somebody puts a charging order on me, are all of you then that are involved in the LLC willing to forego your return on profits just because somebody has a charging order against me? No, because charging orders work in that instance. You guys all want your money. Too bad, Greg. They're going to get the person that has the charging order will get the funds. But when it's closely held, charging orders work great in that you guys we won't distribute out the funds and that's the attorney be gone now in these states here where it's the sole and exclusive remedy alabama i have a client in alabama who went to a local attorney 
to draft an LLC for her. And within the operating agreement, it specifically stated that distributions have to occur on an annual basis to satisfy tax liability. So what that attorney did in that instance is took a state that had great asset protection where I couldn't pierce in. And because of the operating agreement required mandatory annual distributions, I'm going to put that charging order on because when the money comes out each year, I swoop in and grab it. So it all comes down to the operating agreement, even in these states where it says the charging order is exclusive remedy. Remember, LLC statutes, unless the operating agreement says otherwise. So we can lose our asset protection or, or our ability to uh, have the charging order as the sole and exclusive remedy if the operating agreement says something foolish. Now, you'll notice that not all of the states are on here in regards to charging order protection. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have judicial foreclosure. And this is in the states that are very creditor friendly. And judicial foreclosure exists where it doesn't matter what the owner of this LLC or limited partnership did. Doesn't matter that the harm had nothing to do with this company. With judicial foreclosure, the courts will allow the judgment creditor to reach in liquidate out the assets and pull the cash or investment out in their own name. Remember, even in these states that have judicial foreclosure, if the harm occurs inside of here, it stays in here. That's right. There are states that aren't on either one of these lists. Those states are up in the air. And where a state doesn't appear on either one of these lists, then you're going to end up ultimately leaving it to the discretion of the court to determine whether or not your company can be pierced. And there's an old saying that bad facts make bad law. And that's what happened in Florida last year where that single member LLC got pierced because we had an individual out there, a scoundrel, that was intentionally defrauding people, harming them. And in Florida, it wasn't a bright line rule that charging order was the sole and exclusive remedy. And because this guy's actions were so egregious, stealing millions and millions of dollars from people, a bad fact pattern, the court ultimately allowed the people that sued to be able to reach in and pull those assets out. And it doesn't matter now that I have a single member LLC in Florida that has my real estate in there. In the eyes of the court, I'm going to be treated just like that scoundrel in that now if somebody sues me and I have a single member LLC, the court could allow them to reach in and take my investments out. Yes, but let me get to that. Um, because we might want to invest in these states that, that don't have good asset protection. And, and so what people will try to do where, for example, you live in California and you want to invest in California, what is it that you do? Well, people will oftentimes, because they're told Nevada is the be all and end all of all states that have an entity. Well, if you're doing liquid investments, if it's currency, if it's gold, if it's silver, if it's stocks, yeah, you bet Nevada is perfect jurisdiction because we have great protection. And the fact that you invest in currency or invest in the stock market has nothing to do with where you go to bed at night. But when we start doing actual physical transactions in a state, i.e. owning rental properties, what people think they can do is they'll go and they'll set up that Nevada LLC, and then over here they'll have a California rental and what ends up happening is they will deed the property into that Nevada LLC to have better asset protection and also to avoid California's $800 franchise tax. Where is that LLC doing business? 
California. California, absolutely, because it's a California property. And since it's now doing California transactions, what it has to do is known as foreign file. And that's where you take a non an entity from one state and file it to do business in another state. And when you foreign file that LLC, you lose your anonymity. And also, now you're subject to California franchise tax and asset protection laws. So I have my LLC set up in Nevada where it says the sole and exclusive remedy in regard to this LLC is a charging order. But now I take it into California. I'm doing business in California. Now my LLC is subject to California law, which says judicial foreclosure is a remedy. And it doesn't matter that this was a Nevada company that's doing business in California. Now they can reach in and pull out my asset. So ultimately, where we decide to set up our LLC or our other businesses is going to depend upon the type of business activity that we're doing. So we can still, though, have great asset protection. Uh, um, we just have to go about it a little bit different way. Remember, I created this big holding LLC, first of all, in regards to minimizing the amount of tax returns that we had to file. But when I have a California property, what I'll do is I will create a California LLC or an Oregon LLC or a Colorado LLC. I don't like necessarily the asset protection available in any of these states. So in order to preserve my asset protection, I create my holding company. Is this big box doing business in California? No. What it does is it owns a company, a California company. So if I get sued as the owner of this holding company, a charging order is the sole and exclusive remedy. No matter where the LLCs are established inside of here. So I have retained my anonymity and I've retained my asset protection. Now, how do we flow the money? Well, in these instances, and a great question was asked in regards to accounts. Well, ultimately, my rents will flow into each of these LLCs. And then I have another LLC that holds my dinar. Now, do I want to accumulate a lot of wealth inside of that LLC? No, because it's at risk. So the reason why I have an account in this company is to accept the payments, the rents, and then what I end up doing is I take the profit out of the LLC and then put it in the big box and it's safe. And then at any time in the future, as an owner of this company, I can take distributions out of here. And as long as the funds are held in the big box, they're protected. I have a slip and fall on this LLC. I just lose that LLC. Everything else is protected. So I can maintain asset protection. I can maintain anonymity in states that I'm not doing business in. Now, there is a potential time where I might want to have a member managed LLC. If I have a state that requires for me to list who the manager of that company is, I would list this Nevada LLC as a member managed. So when I set up that California LLC, it shows up as the manager being my Nevada holding company. When I set up the Oregon, it will show the Nevada holding company as the manager. And then when they go to Nevada to do a search on this company, does your name pop up anywhere? No. 
so we can preserve your anonymity across the country even when we're setting up LLCs in different states. And ultimately, how many tax returns am I filing? Well, if this, this is just Greg and Lori, how many additional tax returns we file? Zero, because this LLC is also disregarded. But if it's Greg, Lori, and our kids, then we file one tax return. So I have all of the protection without having to pay my CPA 800 to 1200 bucks per LLC for the tax return. So from a transactional standpoint, how do we really make this work? Well, what we do is that pre-RV, we create the LLC. Now, in order for it to be a, a fully functional LLC, it has to be filed. We need an operating agreement. We need an EIN, a tax identification number. Then ultimately we will want to have an account. And as Ron brought up earlier this morning and I talked about, I like the safe deposit box or even potentially purchasing a safe in the name of the LLC. So we're out here with our dinar. And we have Pat as the member. How does Pat actually get his dinar into this LLC? I get a lot of questions from people that if Pat is going to transfer his dinar directly to me, that is a gift. Now, if the gift is under $13,000 on an annual basis, Pat doesn't have to file any additional gift tax returns. The conception then of Pat giving Greg dinar oftentimes carries through to people in making contributions to your LLC. What Pat will do with his dinar, this is called a capital contribution, which means it's not a gift and there's no gift tax liability. So Pat could take a billion dollars or a million dollars at today's pre-RV value and put it in the LLC. There's no tax consequences at all. It is not a gift. It's a capital contribution. You ledger it in. And so this is where the paperwork becomes absolutely essential again. What we do is we will go, first of all, to the unit ledger within the LLC. And in this unit ledger, it asks, in exchange for 100 units in this LLC, what was contributed? So we put the contribution amount in the ledger and indicate that Pat is an owner. And then within the operating agreement itself, um, one of the schedules deals with member contributions. In order for Pat or any of us to become a member in the LLC when it's being created, we have to put something in there. We have to make a contribution. And in exchange for that dinar, we get our ownership interest within the LLC. And so what we do is we fill out the contribution pages. So step one, contribution page. And then step two, the LLC accepts the contribution. And then step three, it's a ledger entry. It's all internal document, documentation. 
So Pat sets up this LLC today, fills out all of this paperwork that he needs to do. The LLC holds the dinar. It doesn't matter that Pat couldn't get down to the bank to open up a safe deposit box or open it up an account to put them in there. He's done the necessary paperwork to make an initial capital contribution to the LLC. Then when we go and we create that account, the reason why we're creating that account pre-RV isn't to take all of our dinar right now and put it with Bank of America in the Bank of America account. It does, that doesn't happen. The reason why we have the bank account pre-RV is that so when the RV occurs, Pat takes his box, his LLC that holds the dinar in it and cashes it out. And since this LLC then has a bank account, the U.S. on money everywhere, the U.S. currency goes in here and now it's held within the LLC bank account. Now, the money is in here. An LLC is a lot like a savings account that we're all used to. If you go and you put a thousand dollars in a savings account, can you pull that thousand dollars out at any time? Do you pay tax when you pull that thousand dollars out of the savings account? No. So at any time, Pat can have a return of capital, no tax consequence. My mic guy. Okay, so at any time within our savings account, if we put money in the savings account, we can withdraw money from the savings account. There is no tax consequence to doing so. And just like if you take and you put your dinar in the LLC, you put a rental property in the LLC, you can always have that asset come back to you. What's that transaction? What's that transaction? Yeah, what's it called? It's called distribution or return of capital. Okay. But generally it's going to be a distribution. So if it was a distribution and there was a lien. I need your mic up. If there was, if I took a distribution out and somebody had a charging order against you, I would attach that distribution. If it was a return of capital, I would argue that in fact it's just a disguised distribution. I would rather, if Pat, you had a charging order against you, we would have it structured as a loan or potentially a uh, salary, earned income for services. Now. If it's earned income, then you pay employment tax. The reason why I think this is a very important concept for everybody to understand is that when we have wealth within our LLCs, we always have the ability to pull wealth out and create other LLCs. Too much? All right. So it'd be nice and subdued. Yeah, thanks, bud. All right. At any time, we can pull wealth out and reposition it to a new company without tax liability. Just like you can pull that money out of your savings account and put it in a brokerage account. No tax liability. And there's no tax liability at all in regard to our dinar investment until it RVs. Now, once it RVs, just for the fact that it RVs doesn't mean we pay tax. Because it's not until we liquidate the 
current the R, the dinar. Then do we have gain on the taxes? The the best example is that if you have ever bought stock, I've owned Microsoft stock since I was 18 years old. It's increased significantly in value. Do I have to pay tax each year on that Microsoft just because it's increased in value? No. But if I sell that Microsoft stock, then I pay the tax. The same thing applies in regards to our dinar. The fact that I currently hold a million, uh, a million dinar and it's valued at 1200 bucks and then at RVs tomorrow at $2 a dinar and now it's worth $2 million. I have no tax liability until I go and cash out. It's the cashing out of the investment that creates the tax liability. Now, re remember that an LLC is just like a savings account. You put a thousand dollars in that savings account and you make fifteen dollars in interest. Does the IRS care when it comes time to report your taxes that you never took that fifteen dollars out? Do you still pay tax on the fifteen dollars even though it's in the savings account? Absolutely. And the same thing holds true with our investments within the LLC. You put a million dinar in the LLC and you sell it, which then creates a two million dollar gain. And you leave the money inside. Ron and his wife leave the money inside of that LLC. Do we have to pay tax on it? No, why not? Quite, or the statement was it's inside of the LLC. Now, if Ron put a million dollars in his brokerage account, and that million dollars grew to three million dollars, and he kept the money in his brokerage account, would he pay tax on the two million dollars in gain? Yes. Absolutely. You made two million dollars. You put a million in, you made another two million, do you think the IRS is going to allow you to escape tax liability just because you kept it in a brokerage account? You put $1,000 in your savings account. You make $15 in interest. Do you pay tax on the $15 even though you left it in the savings account? Yes. So you put the money, your investment in the LLC and you sell or cash out of the investment. You don't take the money out of the LLC. Do you pay tax on the gain? Absolutely. This is what is known as a flow through entity. The IRS does not care if that $2 million stays in or the $2 million comes out to Ron and his wife. Ron and his wife still pay the tax on the $2 million. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Now, Nevada doesn't have a state income tax. Washington doesn't have a state income tax. But Ron and his wife, they live in New York. Yes, so you liquidate out. Do you pay tax in Nevada on the gain? 
No. Do you pay tax on the, at the federal level on the $2 million gains? Yes. Do you pay New York tax? Yes. yes. New York does not care where you made that revenue. If you have ever lived in a state that has a state income tax and you have a brokerage account uh, that you invest in stocks or bonds and mutual funds and that brokerage account makes money, the companies that you're investing in are Delaware companies for the most part. The fact that you've invested in a Delaware company, does that allow you to escape having to pay income tax in California on the gains? No. So it doesn't matter that this is a Nevada LLC or Wyoming LLC or Washington or Florida, states that don't have a federal income or a state income tax. When you live in a state that has an income tax, you have to recognize the gains and pay tax at the state level regardless of where you set up that LLC or limited partnership. Remember, these, the LLC, it's not designed for tax planning. It's designed for asset protection. Ron and his wife, they live in New York. They get in a car accident. The LLC is in Nevada. Can they pierce into his Nevada LLC? No, he's protected. But from a tax standpoint, all of the gains flow down, and it doesn't matter that Ron and his wife kept all of the money in here or took the money out, they still pay tax to the federal government and to the state government in which you reside in. That's why it is important that when we create our LLC, free RV and we take our dinar and we put our dinar in there and then it RVs at five bucks. Will Ron and his wife necessarily from a tax planning standpoint want to go and liquidate out all of that dinar in that LLC for tax planning? Because if they liquidate out all of the dinar in the LLC, do they pay income tax on that? Yes. So now Ron has some options. It's RV'd at a great rate. And so what he might want to do now is prior to cashing this out inside of the LLC, he takes the return of capital. He still sells some of it in the LLC because he wants to have money to live on. He wants to have other money to invest in. And then he takes this other dinar and now start thinking about it from a tax planning standpoint. And this is where potentially charitable remainder trusts become important. Foundations, 501c3. Entities now that we can take your currency that now went from ha having a value of a thousandth of a cent to two bucks, three bucks, five bucks, doesn't matter. And we can contribute it over to this other entity that can sell it and you have no tax liability. So step one in all of the planning is the protection. Step two, once we know what the RV amount is going to be, while it's all protected in here, you might not necessarily want to run out and sell it all in that LLC. We now have other options available to us from a tax planning standpoint. You can sell it all in the LLC, you have great asset protection, you just bear the tax liability at that point in time at the federal and state level. So proper planning needs to progress in stages. It's not you do everything all at once and you're, you're fine for here to eternity. It's right now the concern is in regards to protection. Step two, the concern potentially is in regards to tax planning. If you're not concerned on tax planning, and I have clients that are not concerned on tax planning, 
Um, for example, one person holds over 50 million dinar in the LLC, and the plan is as soon as it RVs to sell it all out, this person does not care about tax planning, that's fine. And then they're going to live off the funds and do other things with the funds. But it's the post RV that gives us the planning opportunity. So then post RV, what I look at then, and actually even pre RV, one important point. is that, Ron, I'll just keep picking on you, Ron and his wife, and let's say that Ron puts his grandchildren. Or actually, keep it simpler. Ron, it's just your kids, and all of your kids are still small, young. So, Ron's children are anywhere between zero in 23. What Ron has done first is that he has put his funds in the LLC pre-RV. Because that million, or let's say 10 million that he put in here under current value is worth $12,000. So Ron can gift out then ownership within this LLC to as many people as he wants without being concerned about going over the $13,000 annual gift tax because the current value of the dinar is right around $1,200 per million. If Ron waited post-RV with that $10 million in here and it came across at 2 bucks a dinar, now Ron has $20 million of assets in here. It makes it much more difficult for Ron to start gifting out ownership to people without going over that $13,000 annual amount. Now up until December 31st, 2012, we each have a lifetime exemption of $5 million. The problem that we encounter when we start dipping into or eating away at that $5 million exemption is that now when we die, the first dollar is immediately subject to estate taxes. And so it's always better from a gifting standpoint. Gift pre-RV because we can gift out more than we can post-RV. Like Lewis, Ron didn't want to relinquish control because if, if Ron just gifted the dinar directly to his kids or Lewis did it directly to his kids or if I did it to my kids, they would go and cash out and buy, my kids for sure, would buy toys, junk, stuff, immediate instant gratification that has no long-term value. I don't want them to do that. So what we're doing is we're gifting them interest in the company pre-RV. Now, because Ron's children are young, just like my children are young, when the RV goes through, and let's say, for example, that we have a $2 million gain, when your kids or anybody else, by default right now, 0 to 18, we have what is known as the kitty tax, which means that between the ages of 0 and 18, when they have passive investments, they're taxed at their parents' tax bracket. So Ron or Greg or Lewis, we wouldn't be gifting ownership to our children if they're under 18 to minimize tax liability because our kids are going to be taxed at our tax bracket. And we have a $2 million gain. We're in the 35% tax bracket regardless if Ron owns it or his three-year-old son. Same tax bracket. 
Now the kitty tax can go all the way up to 23 now if the student is, or if your child is still full-time employed in college, not, there's no other sources of income, you're still claiming them as a dependent, and so the kitty tax can come back and buy you past the age of 18. So the reason why we put our children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews in the LLC pre-RV isn't to minimize income taxes post-RV. What, what we're doing is now Ron had $2 million and if he gave his children 25% interest in that LLC pre-RV, what he really gave them was a $400 gift. Post-RV, since they had interest in the LLC, they've just received $500,000 of interest in that company. So what Ron has done is from a long-term planning perspective, when he passes away and his wife passes away, there's less assets in their estate for potential taxes. And it gives us more avenues from long-term tax planning. But from an income tax point, it won't make a difference. Ron has a brother that's 55 and he gifted units to him. Ron's brother is going to be taxed at Ron's brother's own tax rate. So when we gift out to other people, unless they're minors, they will be taxed at their own tax rate. When they're 0 to 18, potentially to 23, they will be taxed at the parent's tax bracket. Yes. Assuming um, I've already done a lot of gifting in terms of gift letters, but there, there uh, are other relatives I wanted to gift to, and I can you say that um, there is a an entity, myself, my wife, and family members, and I haven't specified who those family members are. I can't identify you have to a lot. specify who the family okay. members are to have ownership. So this is pre-RV planning. Post-RV, just within the LLC, completely ignoring the option of charitable remainder trust or, or, or foundations at this point in time, because we'll deal with that after lunch. Post-RV, now I have this LLC that has all of this wealth in here. Well, Ron could just take income for life or distributions. So he can just live off of that money and, and whoever else is involved in this LLC with him. So he, Ron will probably want to diversify his investments as well. And then that's when we start looking at potentially setting up other LLCs to hold our rental properties. Ron will probably put some of it, I would imagine, in a brokerage account. Well, from an asset protection standpoint, Ron is very well locked up here. But since the LLC is closed through, he has no tax planning opportunities with this current structure. Post-RV, what we will look at doing is setting up a corporation. Somebody just said to spend money, and that's absolutely correct. And this corporation will be a manager and potentially a member in that LLC. Because when we're dealing with a flow-through tax entity, this, and it's getting taxed on our 1040 return, as 1040 filers, we're in the worst position in the world. Because legally, our tax responsibility as 1040 filers is we earn, we pay tax, and then if and only if there are funds left over, do we get to spend the funds. So if I made $10,000 on an investment yesterday afternoon, 
And I took that $10,000 that I made on that investment and I walked into my hotel at the casino and I put it all on 23 black and lost it. Does that mean that I don't have to pay tax on that $10,000? No, it'd be nice, but no, it doesn't work that way. As individual 1040 filers, our legal responsibility is to pay tax prior to us getting to spend the money. So every Every single dollar that we spend is after tax, which generally means you need to make about a buck forty-six for every dollar that we spend. But on the business side of the tax code, businesses get to earn the money, then they get to spend the money. And if and only if there's any funds left over, do they have to pay tax on the profit. And if we set this corporation up properly, we could have it established in a manner in which it never, ever, ever, ever has to generate a taxable profit. Never. And the type of corporation we would be looking at setting up would be a C corporation. A C corporation is the only business entity that has its own separate tax structure. The tax consequences are not tied to the owners of the company. So why have the C corporation? Well, it was brought up to spend. Well, what does the C corporation do? What does it do? It manages our investment. And so what we're able to do now is we're able to collect a fee to oversee our portfolio, to manage our rental properties. And I don't know if anybody, if anyone here has ever had a property manager. Is a property manager going to manage your properties for free? No, they're going to charge a fee. And now it's our corporation that's charging a fee to interact with our tenants or to interact with our portfolio. And because it's charging the fee, then what Ron is able to do and what we're able to do is to reduce our own personal tax liability. Pat. Is the, is the C corporation then inside, it sits inside of the LLC? Holding Corporation? No. Let me show you. The interaction between these two these companies is, on this instance, a contract, and it could be a contract plus ownership potentially. If I have a holding LLC, I'm just going to draw it and erase it. The corporation manages the holding LLC. It's not owned by the holding LLC. Ultimately, who owns your corporation? It's your living trust. The shares in the corporation are owned by your living trust. Okay. Now, can you show me where the, sorry, can you show us where the holding corporation, the, the holding LLC is then? Again, I have the LLC that I want to manage. I put it in the holding company. Remember before when I was holding this box, Greg was holding this box as the manager of the LLC. Now when I hold this box or oversee this box, I wish I had a hat or something, I put on my president hat of my corporation. I do the exact same management of the investments, but I'm doing it as an officer of the corporation. That is correct. And now, based upon the fact that it's a formal business that's overseeing this investment, the business can make money. Granted, before, when it was just Greg, I could pay myself to oversee this, and that's fine, but it doesn't do anything for me from a tax planning standpoint. What the corporation does now is it finally gives me the opportunity to shift income out of my tax bracket by paying a fee up to the corporation. Now, there then is a hierarchy in terms of how we take money out of the corporation. 
because we don't want to run a fee up to the LLC, up to the corporation, and then instantly take that out as salary because I'm in an, the exact same tax standpoint that I was before and that the income always all hits me but now also I have to pay employment tax that's not why I'm setting up the corporation initially is to pull a salary I'm using the corporation to have access to expenses that I personally would not have so in terms of when the money comes up to this corporation we're first looking at reimbursement Now that I have a large net worth, it's incumbent upon me to learn how to invest it and to preserve it. And so oftentimes what we'll consider doing is we'll start paying for investment education classes. And if we pay for those classes on a personal level, if it's involved in real estate, unless you're a licensed agent or broker, those expenses are non-deductible. If you're paying for stock market, market education, unless you are Series 6 and 63 licensed, Series 7, those expenses are non-deductible. Now what we're doing with our corporation is our corporation is involved in asset management, capital development. It's buying these classes because that's its business purpose. So instead of going out and spending $40,000 personally on investment education and not being able to deduct it, it's the corporation that goes and spends the money and it gets a $40,000 deduction. So we look at other avenues in regards to preserving and maintaining and investing our wealth from a business standpoint that creates deductions for us that we otherwise couldn't have. And then also with the money that flows up to the corporation, we look at, not free, see, it's tax-free fringe benefits. And this is where really C corporations shine over S corporations. Within a C corporation, one of my favorite and, and most widely used tax-free fringe benefits is what is known as a medical reimbursement. If you're fortunate enough to work for an employer that covers your medical insurance, I'm sure you're still going out of pocket to cover your spouse or your dependent. Well, you're having to pay money in regards to medical services. Those medical services are non-deductible unless the medical payments exceed 7.5% of your adjusted gross income for that year. And then you're only able to deduct the excess amount of that 7.5%. So you have to be very sick to incur those types of expenses. When we have a C corporation, what we do within the internal documents of this corporation is we have a resolution that allows the reimbursement of any officer or director or employee within our corporation for anything that you are out of pocket on in regard to medical, whether it's the payment of your premiums, the payment of your co-pays, uh, for your office visits, your deductibles for your office visits, your copay for your prescriptions, not only for you, but also for your spouse and dependents. So now we have an, an ability to get reimbursed to create a tax deduction at the corporate level for something that we wouldn't have been able to reimburse ourselves before. When my son fell and hit his head and we had to take him to the emergency room for stitches, I would have taken him to get stitches regardless of whether or not I could get reimbursed. But when I got that ER bill, and my insurance is very good, but it still only covers 50% of emergency room visits, Greg still paid the emergency room, still paid the doctor bill. But as an officer of the corporation, I, I asked the corporate president 
to reimburse me for that expense. Corporate president looked at it, said, Greg, that seemed like a reasonable uh, amount to request reimbursement for. Cuts a check, it became a deduction to the business. The money went back into my pocket tax-free. And so we start coming up with ways that are developed within the tax code to benefit businesses. The tax code, you hear these concepts of tax loopholes. There are no tax loopholes. It's spelled out black and white within the tax code. Whether or not you can take advantage of those benefits in the tax code is going to depend upon if you're operating on the individual side of the code where there's not a lot of benefits. Yeah, you can deduct the mortgage interest and that's about it. Out on the business side where the tax code is written to give businesses an incentive to spend the money. Why is it structured that way? It's based upon the concept that if we give businesses incentive to spend their money pre-tax, that will help stimulate local economies. Someone will eventually pay tax on that money. It's just not the business itself. And that's why we want to operate ultimately post-RV where we start getting involved in all other types of investment endeavors, start operating under the section of the tax code that's really going to benefit not only us in terms of wealth preservation, but subsequent generations. And so this is where the planning really takes hold. And then depending upon the type of investing you're doing, you could potentially take out a salary. And then once you take out a salary, we take it up to another level and we'll look at creating a corporate pension plan. It's called a 401A profit sharing plan where we take your existing or you'll take your existing IRAs, former 401ks, 403bs, and you'll roll those over. And unlike a self-directed IRA where you have to bounce transactions off the custodian, not the case. A pension is really a trust. And the person that controls the trust is the trustee. Who do you think would be the trustee of your corporate pension plan? You. So now you have unfeathered investment discretion within this plan. Whether it's you wanted to buy more currency, whether you wanted to buy rental property, whether you wanted to buy precious metals, you can make any investment for the most part that you could at an individual level inside of this plan. And then if you want, but generally post-RV, we're not going to want to be borrowing money, but what you can do is you could take out a loan from the plan. But most importantly, from an asset protection standpoint, if we get a third party, so the participants of the plan, if it's somebody other than just you and your spouse, it could be your kids, brothers, mothers, you name it. Someone other than your spouse, then your plan falls under ERISA. It's the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. When it comes to asset protection, it is the best asset protection hands down. LLCs, limited partnerships are great when it's all involved in keeping the money inside of here. But remember, once you start taking distributions out, if there's a charging order, somebody can attack it. An ERISA-governed pension plan is the only entity that protects you from yourself. The poster boy for ERISA is O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson has a $30 million wrongful death judgment against him from the Browns and Goldman. He takes roughly $24,000 a, a month out of his NFL 401k plan. Since that NFL 401k is governed under ERISA, the money is protected when it's in the plan. It's protected when it comes out of the plan. It always remains protected. It is the best asset protection there is. There's three instances on any type of retirement plan we can pierce. Child support, spousal support, IRS tax lien. Other than that, under a ERISA plan, the money is protected when it's in, and it always remains protected when it comes out. Only entity that can protect you from yourself.
for somebody who's never had an LLC or a corp or a trust, any of that stuff, how much effort are they going to need to put into operating this on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis? Great question. In general. Okay. Question was, if, if you guys didn't hear, is that if you've never had a business entity, how much effort is going to be involved in regards to operations? Well, with an LLC, my first, my answer is it depends on how the operating agreement is drafted. But ideally, you have a good operating agreement. And so on a daily basis, you have the account in the LLC or accounts. You can have as many bank, brokerage accounts with as many institutions as you want. You have, you can separate out those assets as many different little pieces as you want to. So let's say, for example, that if it's a brokerage account and you want to trade, it's just when you push the button to execute that trade in that LLC, you're just wearing a hat as the manager. You still push the exact same button. Where people get in trouble with businesses is that if the business requires annual meetings and you don't have the annual meetings, boom, piercing. The other way is where they don't treat it as a separate entity. Funds are commingled. I need to go pick up groceries when I get home. What I don't what I do is I take a distribution, which means I will either do an electronic transfer from my LLC account to my personal account, or I will cut a check out of the LLC from the company to Gray. Once I take that distribution, I go to the store. What you do not want to do with your LLC is to use the LLC assets directly to buy groceries. That LLC is separate from you. So you don't use the funds directly in the company to buy groceries, to buy your clothes, to buy your cars. Those are personal expenses. And when you use an LLC for those type of personal expenses, what could potentially happen in a lawsuit is that somebody would claim that there's really no distinction between you and the box. You're one and the same and everything gets lumped together. So remember, at any time, any time, you can reach in and pull money out. I always need to take money out and then go to Safeway or Albertsons or whatever and pay that expense personally. Remember, you still have to have personal money. You still are going to have a personal checking account. You're just not going to accumulate a lot of wealth in that personal checking account. But this LLC is not you. It's, it's, it's a Zen thing. It's you, but it's not you. Yes, you control it, but it's not you. At any time, you could take the money out, but, but you don't go and, and, and buy your kids toys directly out of the LLC account. You take the money first and then take them to the service. This is really an important component, and this is what our clients are paying us for the platinum, the, the, the support, on how to get the money out and when to use the money for. One question, and then we're going to have to break for lunch. Ron? You have a business account, yes. and um, we come to boss, we have certain meetings, we uh -huh. meet with other people, we've met with realtors. Meanwhile, we're still waiting for the RV, right. and we have a credit card for our business account yes. and occasionally to cover gas expenses you use that card mm -hmm. for an occasional gas payment right is that reasonable Ron you just answered the question because you're making that gas that payment of the gas to come to the corporate office to do or your business office to, for business activity you're engaged in business activity what you're not doing is you're not using that LLC card to fund your gas, to drive over to Disney, and then to buy your park passes through the LLC. Those are personal expenses. So if it's a business expense, no problem. 
but if we want to keep personal expenses separate. And so what we're going to do, guys, it's just a little afternoon Pacific right now. We're about five after. We're going to take an hour break. We'll be back in an hour. Clint's going to come up, and he's going to start talking about charitable remainder trust. I'll be back in the afternoon talking about estate planning. So have a, go have a good lunch. Um, be back in an hour. I have to pick up all of my dinar and other gold. Not because of the people here, but because of my partners that are floating around. In a bit.